Thank you very much for having me here. And thank you, Ambassador Davadort, for coming, joining, uh, joining us today on my presentation. And uh, what you just saw is a very, very abbreviated version of cultural industry in Mongolia for last 2,222 years. Because uh, the costumes here looks maybe from the uh, creativity of Hollywood designers, but it's not. It's a creativity we found in an archaeological uh, finding and from the history, from the arts that uh, was uh, uh, inherited to us from five or six uh, nomadic empires that ruled uh, sometimes over the territory of Mongolia. So the first, uh, the scary looking guy, was from a uh, Hunnu Empire, uh, which is uh, the empire that actually uh, was a nomadic empire, of course, uh, that caused the building of the Great Wall of China. And the others follow uh, like a Turkish Empire, Uyghur Empire, and Kudan, etc. And uh, uh, one of the late, uh, most famous in the world was Chinggis Khan. And Chinggis Khan's um, uh, rule was 810 years ago. And following Chinggis Khan, there was other of his sons and grandsons like Hobla Hang and etc. And uh, the last costumes you saw was uh, the costumes from 100 years ago. Uh, the last uh, religious and uh, religious leader of Mongolia, uh, Bogdan, which is the, the exact same costumes and, uh, of his and his queens are now, uh, uh, now displayed in the Mongolian Museum of Bogdan. So this is just a glimpse of creativity of uh, the Hans and the, uh, the queens, the kings and queens of many, many uh, generations ago. And also all those were nomadic uh, countries and all those inherited us beautiful nomadic culture. So I'm very happy to talk about nomadic culture today because you uh, students and uh, um, uh, researchers and academicians are now studying very hard to make a better world uh, especially using cultural diplomacy. And I appreciate that very much because in order to build a better society, better world, we really need to understand each other's culture. Without that, it's very uh, hard to make any other diplomacy work. So nomadic uh, culture is another fascinating uh, corner of the world to see where diplomacy really works in everyday life. Uh, when we talk about nomadic life style. We are talking about actually more enormous big of uh, common land, pasture. Without big enough pasture, there is no nomadic culture. So there is a land out there uh, in nobody's possession, but everybody can use. So in every city we have a common, we have a park, but in Mongolia we have a, maybe the biggest common. It's about 1.5 million square kilometers of a common land that is used for everybody who would like to raise uh, livestock in a, in a traditional nomadic way. Actually, after we privatize land to every one person in Mongolia, according to our land privatization law, we can privatize only 3% of our land, but 97% of it will be always common land. So we, we uh, since Mongolia was ever established, like 2,220 years ago, land was always a common property. Land was always a pasture, and nomadic culture was the main economy, uh, name, main cultural and economic basis and foundation for Mongolia. So this remains at this, uh, as it is uh, since 1990 democracy. Uh, of, uh, of democracy, democratic revolution uh, happened in Mongolia, and our new constitution that was adopted in 1992 uh, guarantees that pasture will never be privatized, and pasture will be always used for nomadic reasons, nomadic culture. So when we're talking about this big land of pasture, we're talking about uh, freedom of movement of a life, of, uh, of a ha household that they can move any place uh, where there is a better vegetation or better uh, water sources any time of the year. So 
this much freedom of movement creates a relationship, uh, conditions a relationship that everybody has to understand each other's uh, ac actions without fighting with each other. So it, uh, it uh, conditions uh, lots of unwritten rules and laws according to which a nomadic family can move from one place to another without harming the other families. So it, uh, it actually uh, brings lots of culture in tact and diplomacy between the households, between the uh, economies inside Mongolia and uh, earlier investors, especially foreign investors coming to Mongolia uh, late 1990s, didn't understand these unwritten diplomatic rules. And they thought that there was a big empty space of land, a piece of land, and they always thought that, oh, there is no family here. This is nobody's land, so we can dig anywhere and we can claim any well and any mountain. So it created lots of misunderstanding with Mongolian population. Suddenly, people started uh, uh, boycotting the mining and people started uh, blaming the investors for not considering their needs. And then now, slowly, uh, when investors started to study the culture of Mongolian nomadic lifestyle, they started now make, making a much better and, uh, relationship with uh, local people because they now know that there is a no land which is nobody's in Mongolia. Actually, every land is everybody's. So that's why we have to uh, negotiate with so many people in order to secure some fence in some place. If uh, somebody asks you, where is the biggest fenceless land, it's uh, Mongolia, because people hate fences, especially in nomadic culture, there is no need for fences. So all land is open space for everybody. So because of this uh, nature of um, uh, uh, freedom of movement of, of this economy, it creates its own very special culture too. So usually what happens is in a big mountain, there is a, one side of the mountain is one family, the other side of the mountain is second family. They are separated, and uh, it's a, it's a very, uh, for after listening to millions of millions of tourists' numbers and millions of millions of money, it's very hard to comprehend what's happening in Mongolia because we are talking about very few families, we are very few people, and also very scattered population. Mongolia is uh, the the number one scattered uh, country because we have uh, less than three million people. Uh, it will be big success for us if we reach 3 million population within this year. Uh, we have like 70,000 short to the 3 million so far. And we are going to have 3 million horses this year uh, at the same time. So it's a uh, 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 one horse per person. It's been always one horse per person country. And the horses population and the human population always uh, compete. So this year we want we want to reach peace together, reaching three 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 million together, and also we have uh, fifty four million livestock in in total, and um, so the if different caucuses are formed in a Gobi desert, uh, in a river bases, and in the mountains, in the forests because of the ecology, because of the uh, ecosystems that uh, is dictating the, the movement of the herders, uh, every ecosystem creates a little bit of niche for every other different cultures. So their songs are different, dances are different, clothing is different, food is different in every little niche. So it's, it creates a very interesting uh, cultural, rich cultural heritage for us. And also it uh, because of the nature and because of the ecosystems, the survival skills are also very different. So when we talk about Mongolia, I was thinking, I was just looking at seashells and was thinking, this is country that probably market itself like a paradise. But Mongolia is not a paradise <laughs> for sure because we have four seasons uh, which actually tests human, uh, uh, human, uh, uh, survival skill, because we have hot summer that can reach up to 30, sometimes 35 degrees. And we have cold winter, which is minus 30, 40 degrees. 
And before I left for Berlin, uh, in Ulaanbaatar, that was a minus 20 Celsius. But because of this variety of temperatures, variety of seasons, there are lots of uh, ways to survive through this, not only yourself as a human being, but as a group, as a culture, and also as a family with all your herds and animals. So that creates lots of um, uh, uh, room to uh, dramas and all kinds of things. And then, of course, Mongolian culture totally enjoys having this nomadic culture and our films and our paintings and our art and everything is, of course, uh, inspired by nomadic culture. And then a uh, recent study on tourism uh, showed uh, in, my, in our key markets that 90% of tourists coming to Mongolia actually come to experience nomadic lifestyle, uh, experience horse riding, camel riding, or uh, milking a cow, or just eating <laughs> something that's made of milk. And uh, uh, it's uh, enjoyable uh, to, to enjoy nomadic lifestyle is something that city dwellers, especially adventure lovers, want to try uh, once in a life. But sometimes they come over and over because Mongolia is a big territory. You can't uh, see everything in just one holiday. In the Gobi Desert, you see something very different than you see in the northern lake areas. And in Orhan Valley, where you see the historic archaeological sites, but in the other side of uh, Ulaanbaatar Hinti province, you will see legendary places where Mongolian Empire of Chinggis Khan was born. So mountains, lakes, uh, 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 deserts, and steppes, and everything is so, uh, gives you so different experiences. So people come uh, over and over, uh, those who like adventures and experiences in countryside, and especially experiences in free and open spaces, they come to Mongolia uh, repeatedly. What a challenge and opportunity we have because of our nomadic cultures. We have many, many opportunities to give uh, uh, good income for, for our herders if we develop our tourism along with the local people. In the early days of tourism development, Mongolia actually opened for international tourism very recently. Before 1990, we were uh, just a closed country like today's North Korea. Nobody could enter Mongolia, and Mongolia was politically a very closed place. But after 1990, we started opening small by small. So uh, because our tourism industry when it, uh, is new, when it uh, first started in 1990s, very few people benefited from tourism industry. Only those probably elites who knew languages, foreign languages, because English language was a prohibited language politically before 1990. So very few people knew English language. So very few people could take advantage of touristic, uh, tourism industry after Mongolia opened. But now more and more young people know uh, foreign languages. And more and more um, democratization is uh, happening in Mongolia. And local giving to local people, especially incorporating nomadic uh, population to tourism businesses is expanding. So that brings a, a big opportunity for Mongolia and gives us a big ambition to announce ourselves as a partner country to ITB next year because we are eager to bring more uh, interesting uh, adventures to new generation of tourists uh, who would like to uh, experience nomadic lifestyle while having a good service in Mongolia. Our government is actually uh, uh, was formed two years ago. Uh, uh, when it uh, form was to formed two years ago, uh, they appointed me into a new position. There was no uh, culture, sports, and tourism ministry before. Culture was a part of the education ministry, and uh, uh, tourism was a part of an uh, environmental ministry, and uh, sports was a part of a health ministry. So when I first started serving as a minister, I actually was fascinated how culture and tourism was so connected in Mongolia, much better connected than education and culture. Because uh, without learning our culture, especially our the deep nomadic culture, we can't make a successful tourism. 
So when we understand the cultures, especially cultures between the provinces, cultures between the uh, communities, we started understanding how Mongolian tourism should grow. So actually, we started finding ourselves only after we understand, understood our root of our culture. So it's very important to know why certain cultures are very sensitive in some areas and certain culture can be capitalized in another country, in another part of the Mongolia. So there is one example I would like to tell you about why culture is so important in investing in Mongolia. For example, there's a, I can't name the company, but there is a Western successful company wanted to make a good business with Mongolian leather. Uh, as soon as the, any investor hears about the number of livestock that Mongolia has, 54 million livestock, immediately they think that, oh, this is the best leather uh, provider. So Mongolia can be a good source of leather business, and they would like to do a good leather products with Mongolians. As soon as they come to Mongolia and research Mongolian leathers, they started seeing defected adult thick leather only on the market. And they would say, why don't you provide us a thin, undefected, little baby animal's leather, please? And then no Mongolian wanted to make business with him and says, no, we don't kill baby animals. We don't ever eat baby animal meat. We don't ever kill baby animal skin. So we can't provide that. So the investors would explain that this is such a good market. This is such an expensive market. You could do profit. You could do money. And Mongolian herder would say, I don't need money. I need my baby animal. I need that because I love it. So for them, it's a, a baby animal is their family member. Nobody wants to eat baby animal meat. Instead, everybody prefers tough meat and thick skin, thick leather, defected or whatever, and less money instead of killing their baby animals. So this is a big cultural shock that investors would sometimes have when they see the numbers and then go to the, uh, uh, go to the country. That's why when we ask uh, investors coming to Mongolia uh, to study uh, about nomadic culture more, is because without knowing them, uh, in the short run, they might make money, but in the long run, it will create political unrest even. Because in some places, without uh, knowing the local boundaries of where to get water or where to dump the waste, uh, people go into trouble. Our tourism businesses also go into trouble without knowing local customs. There was one exploitation uh, uh, round of Mongolian nomadic culture one time in Lonely Planet of mid-1990s. There was an explanation of Mongolian nomadic taboos and uh, Mongolian nomadic hospitality. So the Lonely Planet issue, uh, many issues of Lon Lonely Planet, explained to young travelers, adventure travelers, saying that Mongolia is the best place to go and travel for free. Because every nomadic family will feed you for free, give you bed for free, and uh, give you even your gift for coming to your home. So that's Mongolian custom. So there would become so many backpackers coming to Mongolia and started exploiting nomadic good tradition of hospitality because it's, it is the custom to treat people well. But then people like me, I was an author of a book of 2007. Before I became a minister, I had to write a book to teach herders how to charge money from a guest. Because in our custom, there is a no. Uh, especially if you're a nomadic uh, herder in a, in a step, if a guest comes, you never ask money. If guest gives you money, you take, but if you can't ask it, uh, according to our good old tradition. But I had to teach that you could ask $10, you could ask $20 for this, this, this service, and if you, when you ask, you use this kind of sentence, please. So we would tell the uh, herders, what kind of sentence, what kind of words they could use in order to politely ask for services. And which is now becoming a, a quite a routine in especially more touristic areas. And uh, it's, still it's uh, becoming uh, one of the challenge to the sustainability of tourism. 
because we don't want too many exploited exploiters, but we want more sustainable tourists. So that's why uh, uh, one of the challenges now, how to incorporate local hospitality with the, uh, with the decent, uh, decent pay and uh, also how to make local people encourage tourism. Because local people, my aunt, my aunt, she's a herder. And for her, uh, like two years ago, she killed the whole ship for uh, two guests, for uh, uh, two backpackers who came abroad and who killed the whole ship to host them as she hosted a uh, very rare guest. And they ate everything <laughs> and then ate him, took some meat and then went away without giving anything. And then she said, okay, in Mongolian tradition, when somebody would kill a sheep for them, they would eat and they would sometimes give some gifts back and they wouldn't take meat uh, with them. And somehow these guests understood us wrongly. So, so because uh, even the hospitality was uh, written in the Lonely Planet, it wasn't re written uh, what is the right measure to use that hospitality too. But this is actually improving because of the openness of information uh, uh, in, in, the in the contrary of those uh, uh, widespread uh, misunderstanding. We are actually aggressively educating our people how to, uh, uh, have to uh, make it a tourism service, not just everyday uh, routine hospitality, but at the same time, uh, local governors and local um, Authorities are now trying to organize events where local people can sell their products, not just give away everything for free. So there are many, uh, many traditional events in Mongolia. One of the most famous events is called Nadam. So it's, it spells like N-A-A-D-A-M, Nadam. So if you Google Nadam, you can see all kinds of uh, uh, sports, uh, uh, events, uh, horse racing, wrestling, and archery, and other cultural events, pictures. Uh, this is actually the oldest festivals, oldest sports event in Mongolia that's been maybe happening 2,000 years. So this event is uh, uh, usually happens during uh, uh, summer months from July 7 till the end of July, everywhere in Mongolia, somehow there will be Nadam. But the biggest state Nadam happens July 11 and July 12 every year. Uh, and the state provides the funding for organization of the Nadam. Uh, it is very uh, strange that uh, in Mongolia, uh, Nadam was never, uh, 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 never uh, missed during any hardships. Whatever time it was, whether it was Chinggis Khan's time, whether it was communist time, whether it is democ democracy, Nadam always happens, and the state always provides this uh, festival. And during the Nadam, I'll give you some statistics. Uh, all over Mongolia, between July to July 20, July 7 to July 20, the, there will be at least 22,400 wrestlers will be wrestling. So at one event, at least 60 wrestlers, and then the biggest places, it's 512 wrestlers. So all over the country, at least 105,000 horses will be ra racing uh, with children uh, riding them. And at least 9,500 archers will be shooting in arrows uh, for local spectators. So uh, in uh, many places of Mongolia, you can see Nadam. And Mongolia is also historically very tolerant to all religions. And uh, maybe the first country to make a law on, uh, on uh, religious tolerance. Every religion is appreciated there. And uh, it's a very egalitarian culture. Children, adults alike, women, men alike, it's all, everybody's quite egalitarian. And there is a historically not so many hierarchies, especially if you are in a white in the countryside, your biggest um, counterpart is weather, your biggest counterpart is climate, but not each other, you know. So that's why there is a culture of being very uh, treating each other equally.
from childhood, and that's why children are quite straightforward. And this, for those who are visiting Mongolia, I would like to give uh, some advice uh, what they would expect from Mongolia. First of all, you should expect very straightforward people, honest, straightforward, friendly people. And probably you will come to Mongolia on a very sunny day because uh, our 300 out of 365 days of the year is sunny. And also what you would expect is usually you would uh, go to countryside and find yourself in an immense uh, space where, uh, where you can see horizons after horizons and just feel liberated from crowded city life. So that's three things that will always um, be uh, uh, guaranteed there. But other adventures, uh, there will be different adventures for different tourists. And uh, also, I would like you uh, to not to plan everything minute by minute, because those who do a uh, very meticulous planning, Mongolia is a little different place, because uh, Mongolia and many things in Mongolia are very spontaneous. spontaneous. Um, so that's why uh, those who like to have 8 o'clock wake up and 8.15 breakfast and 8.30 train ride, etc., this doesn't go that way in Mongolia. In Mongolia, everything kind of goes naturally. Natural time. We, if you are planning to go out by 8, you might go out by 9 because uh, uh, an hour, a nomadic herder might say, say that, oh, I need to bring my horses first because my horses were not, she, my horses or my camels don't know the time to arrive home. As soon as they arrive, I'll take you that way, etc. So there are lots of natural uh, delays sometimes happens, but those who lack just spontaneous adventures, this is a very uh, exciting place to be. Uh, we, especially in Ulaanbaatar, in uh, city life, we try to be uh, on a time, time schedule, but in a countryside, I think I would uh, ask everyone just to enjoy themselves and enjoy the spontaneity of nomadic lifestyle. That also can be a very fascinating experience, and uh, that's why Mongolian uh, tourism, logo, tourism slogan is Mongolia nomadic by nature. So those who love nature, those who love nomadic lifestyle, welcome to Mongolia. Well, I'd like to express our gratitude on behalf of the Institute to the Minister for the excellent presentation, and I think we're all very excited now about going to Mongolia. Uh, but before I allow you to continue in the adventure in your mind of going to Mongolia, we would be very happy to take questions and comments for the Minister uh, about maybe the fashion show initially, or the presentation, or about Mongolia. Who would like to pose a question or make a comment? Okay, in the back. So if my colleague could just bring the microphone in the back. And as always, if you could briefly introduce yourself, it would be excellent. And Stan, so we can get you on the video camera. Thank you so much, Minister, um, for the presentation. It's an, a privilege and an honor to be able to address you here in Berlin. My name is um, Mats Mateusz Jastold Fritzberger, and um, my family belongs to the nomadic people reaching the forest to the west, mm -hmm. the Lipka Tatars of mm -hmm. Poland. Wow. And um, my uh, family name, Jastold, in fact means tribal horsemen, oh, really? as in people on horseback. Mm -hmm. um, so f to me, you represent um, um, a, a most um, uh, uh, definite uh, current voice of my own heritage. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> <Thank> um, <laughs> and I will ask you um, um, as to what kind of um, affiliations, contacts do you have currently to the neighboring nations in the, for example, the Russian Federation? Uh, because uh, living um, the nomadic lifestyle uh, is, of course, not uh, only restricted to the recent territory of uh, the modern state of Mongolia, but reaching uh, outside of that. So what is the the affiliations to the other people living outside of the border. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Thank you for your question. Uh, yes, uh, I even so nomadic, uh, the core, core land is in Mongolia. There are many nomadic uh, communities with, uh, in our neighboring countries. Russia has it, Kyrgyzstan has it, Kazakhstan has it, Northern China has it, uh, Inner Mongolia in China has it. So many places there are still nomadic uh, culture uh, surviving in their own in their own ways. And uh, we have an institution called, um, <laughs> I'm trying to translate it. So, so Nomadic uh, Civilization Center, uh, which is actually UNESCO registered uh, research organization that tries to connect all these nomadic civilizations uh, in, in Mongolia and uh, around Eurasia. Uh, and trying to help the communities keep their heritages, knowledges, traditional knowledges, and help them uh, convey their traditions and cultures to, to the younger generation. So through that, institution would be uh, the best uh, connected to the more information about nomadic culture. Also, of course, Mongolian uh, uh, Academy of Science has uh, affiliation uh, research institutions to all those uh, who are interested in nomadic culture and Mongolian history. Is there a second mm -hmm. question for the minister or a mm -hmm. comment? Don't be shy, please. Hello, my name is Camilla. Um, of course, I join with the compliments about the beautiful display that we witnessed as well as the fantastic presentation. Thank you very much for that. Um, I just wanted to touch upon what you mentioned about gender and male and women mm -hmm. being harmonized and just working together. But is, is it primarily um, patriarchal or matriarchal society, or is there no differentiation, differentiation whatsoever? Thank you. This is a very good question. <laughs> Thank you for this question. And uh, it's a... International Women's Day approaching too. I'm also president of Democratic Women's Union in Mongolia, so I uh, touch on uh, gender issues a lot. And I'm very happy to answer this question because it's very different. Uh, uh, can't they, I can't say one answer to your question because it depends what is your livestock. So if uh, in a herder society, if there are more, most of the family's livestock is horses, it's a very patriarchal family. Because the horses the roam around much farther dis the distances, and uh, herding horses requires lots of toughness and riding far away, etc. So and fighting with wolves all the time. So that really uh, dictates a different culture in the family that uh, the family man is much more important. But in a culture where cows are more important, if family possesses more cattle and cows, and the cow milking lady is the most important income bringing in the house, usually that family is matriarchal. So I, I grew up in a northern hoof school uh, as a nomadic, uh, in the nomadic herders, grandparents. Even so, my father and mother were uh, teacher and tra technicians. I would always go to summer break to my grand grandparents, where they most uh, important animals were cows. Every summer we would milk lots of cows, and we would uh, women would be most important person in our family. And in those provinces, especially, uh, women is not so matriarch, but never patriarchal. <laughs> so, so in general, in general. Uh, in general, in Mongolian society, women's role is very high. Uh, we have 70% uh, of university graduates women, 90% of doctors women, 80% of lawyers women, 60% of engineers women, and teachers, maybe even 95% teachers are women. And we are very having big trouble of bringing educated men into these sectors, and we are we're having a reverse gender cap that problem, we are being uh, blasted for being too unequal in these sectors. But there are two sectors where men are dominating. Of course, one is mining sector, where only 5% is women. 
And second, most men dominated sector is politics. Uh, politics, in politics, we just, just uh, two years ago, in politics, we had only 3% women in high positions. Now, in, um, in our government, in our parliament, we have 12% women in the parliament and 15% uh, women in cabinet, which is a huge success. I, uh, Mongolia even received the prize for jumping up that fast, but it's still not enough, of course. So in the high political positions, still we are very patriarchal, but in the middle level, government positions, 45% are women. So it's a, the society is very different. Even in the harder society, we can't say whether it's a, just a matriarchal or patriarchal because it depending on, on the animals, the community is becoming very different.